Live from the Sands Convention Center, Las Vegas, Nevada. Extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering HP Discover 2015. Brought to you by HP. And now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Hi everybody, welcome back to HP Discover. I'm Dave Vellante, and this is theCUBE. theCUBE is our live mobile studio. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. We've done something special for this HP Discover. Check out hpdiscover.social. It brings together all the social media streams, all the video, a lot of content, all access, so please check that out. Sylvia Hooks is here, she's the Senior Director of America's Marketing at HP, and Alex Munro, a CUBE alum, is the Assistant Vice President, Corporate IT and Enterprise Technologies at Pacific Life. Folks, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks so much, Thanks, it's great to be here. So, let's, Sylvia, Sylvia, you're new to the to yes, the Cube. my first time. Uh, so, welcome. Thank and, you. Uh, so let's start with you. You got to be really excited about the sort of, the transformation, not only in the industry, but, but of HP. We heard Meg talk about so the HP Enterprise. Uh, we heard Dominic talk about, yeah. you know, Ruby stole the show yesterday, <laughs> so how do you feel? I feel awesome. So I can, I can really say for all of Aruba that this acquisition is hugely exciting. We've been a little island fighting against big competitors and the idea of being part of a successful big company that can really take us to the next level makes everybody excited. Uh, and the people that we've been meeting and the customers that we've been talking to feel the same way um, and it's great to get a warm reception. We're, we really feel welcomed with open arms. Yeah, so Alex, I wonder, I mean, from your standpoint, it's, HP was very quiet on the acquisition front because it was paying down some debt and cleaning up its balance sheet and now it's been you know, much more acquisitive. Is that important to you from a customer standpoint? Do you pay attention to those types of things? Uh, regarding the acquisition? Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, for us it was a, a surprise, but it was a pleasant surprise. So we had been an Aruba customer for years and had really uh, invested in our wireless infrastructure. And then we had recently uh, become an HP networking customer. So we were in the, uh, a big transformation of rolling out all our data centers, all our IDF closets, all our campuses onto HP networking. And so the announcement literally happened right at the perfect time for us. Um, and we've been leveraging tools, you know, both from Aruba and HP, and uh, it's just been a good, good experience. Do you think Pacific Life? I mean, I was talking off camera about all this discussion about the digital economy. Meg talking about the idea economy. It's a real theme now. Everybody looks at Uber and Airbnb and Waze as examples of disruption. And, and but here's Pacific Life. You're a very successful company. I mean, I don't know how long you've been around, but it's been a long time. So. The imperative to change is not necessarily, you know, right there. Right. But you know, we all are familiar in the tech business with Andy Grove's, you know, you know, paranoid, you know, mantra. But is it difficult to get change in a in a in a successful company like that that has a lot of entrenched, you know, beliefs? Yeah, I think um, there's two challenges. One is regulation, compliance, audit, security, and and you sort of have to jump over those hurdles and make sure when you're enabling employees to be more productive or work from anywhere or you know giving them mobile devices and they you want them to be productive from home you know from the airport or when they're in the uh, building maybe not at their desk but in a meeting room how do you how do you have that seamless work experience so they can be productive but how do you make sure you're still protecting you know the company assets and, and what we do and to your point you know Pacific Life is a, a very um, uh, established company we have a very uh, premium brand and so we always weigh convenience with, at the same time, compliance and audit, you know, and just making sure that we're dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's when we roll out, uh, you know, things like wireless infrastructure. Yeah, as an IT executive, you always have to balance the, I call it, a, 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 a liabilities and assets, the, you know, data risk and data value. Um, and so, and from your standpoint, Sylvia, if you have to, convince every customer that they have to go through a cultural transformation, <laughs> you know, it'd be a real slog. So how do you deal with that? You just find the, the sort of leading adopters, the open-minded well, so customers? So it turns out we're not actually usually convincing them, yeah. right? They're coming to us. They're dragging uh, you into yeah, it. Yeah, right, so the users, I mean, the generational shift and the technology that's come with us from back when we used to work only in offices to where now we want to be connected all the time from every place, it puts a burden on, on IT. And so IT is coming to us saying, my users are demanding this, how do I satisfy it? And there's there's a lot of, of ways you can do that to be compliant, you know, how much openness do you offer? Um, Gartner has laid out a, a methodology where, you know, the more trust you have of a device, the more 
access you give them. And I know that's p what Pacific Life is doing, that they give access for devices that they manage. Um, so you kind of have to look at with each customer, what are they trying to achieve? But we never are in a position of having to convince them because their users are doing that for them. Their users are, are dragging in all these consumer devices and then how the customer chooses to adopt that um, BYOD policy or how they choose to open up their networks depends on, on how much security concerns they have or how uh, much regulation of the data. So that's interesting, I want to un unpack that a little bit, but Alex, let's back up. So last time you were on was a year ago. What's What's been the big change in the past 12 months within your organization? Um, from, you know, from a networking and from a, a wireless perspective, probably the biggest, uh, I'll call it a little bit of a surprise, was the adoption of link and uh, real-time voice video collaboration. And once people got used to joining a meeting via IP, just clicking on a link and coming in via a uh, a web browser, but also having voice and video capability, sometimes high def video, the bar was up significantly from a latency perspective and from a performance perspective. And, and people wanted this not only in rooms, but walking from room to room and you know getting in the elevator and going between floors. People expected all of a sudden to stay connected into these you know real time collaborative sessions. And that was uh, something that you know took us by surprise a little bit. And uh, when it works well, it's a great experience. When it doesn't, you know, sometimes you hear about it. So we've spent a lot of energy in that area. Um, just making employees, you know, the other thing I want to bring up with Aruba that we love, um, we, we rolled out certificate servers, we rolled out a product called ClearPass, they make for authentication, and we do provide most of our employees with a company-owned device, but it allows us to give them that seamless um, joining of the network as soon as they enter the building. And they can access their data, they can access their file shares, they can access, you know, information they need to collaborate, uh, without having to go through a, a multiple hoop process to get onto the wireless network. So it's not a BYOD model at Pacific Life? Or? We, we have BYOD, but more for guest networks. So we have a contractor network, we have a guest network, uh, and then we have the um, we have the company network. The, the, the nice thing again about Aruba is we can manage all that off of one set of infrastructure, but it's different trust policies and it's different level of access based on whether you're with, on a company device or whether you're on a, an, a, 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 a personal device. And so the, in, in a, in a, does an employee have a choice to bring his or her personal um, device in and they just get yeah. the, the, the less open get, network? Yeah, exactly. yeah, you get the less open. So, so in general, um, you know, all executives, management, et cetera, are knowledge workers, we give them a device. We just consider it part of a tool that that person needs to work. Where you get into gray areas is with hourly employees and lower level employees, and there's 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 different reasons why you may not want to give all of those employees a mobile device. Well, the ROI might not be there. The ROI right? might not be there, and you may want them at their desk answering the phone or, or doing work. And so for that employee, we actually have something called Cafe Net. When they go into the lunch cafeteria or the cafe, it's a wide open personal network, and then they can talk to their friends, they can go to Facebook, they can see their pets and their kids at home via video, and but they're doing all that on a guest network, and it's not part of the company network. A lot of companies, I remember, maybe in the last I don't know, three or four years, have just taken away, you know, <laughs> company-sponsored uh, smartphones, for example. Mm -hmm. It's kind of short-sighted, right? I mean, you yeah. don't obviously don't take that philosophy. Yeah, there's just economies of scale with uh, centrally managed uh, cell phone contracts, and then also just lost devices. Uh, you know, we, we want the ability to be able to wipe a device. Yeah, of we course. We want to have control of what's on that device. We we need a certain amount of. Um, ability to manage that device. So we've made a decision that it it's really not worth that savings to uh, to have all these different types of devices brought in. What, what um, do you what do you see with other customers? Yeah, so it's across the board. I mean, I think some some companies have decided, "Hey, you know what? If our um, users want to bring their own devices, they can do that, but they're responsible for them." So then you're in a position of, well, your health desk doesn't really support those anymore, right. so maybe those people aren't quite as productive as they might be. So Pacific Life doesn't want to use that model. They want to support their users, make sure they have the right tools. But you know, each, each business is different, and I think the point that you made earlier about you know, our infrastructure will allow those choices, and you can even change your mind. So with our controllers and with ClearPass, you can set the policy you want for the scenario, and maybe different classes of employees, like the hourly employees can BYOD. They just get on the guest network and have internet access, uh, but the more uh, knowledge worker types get the full access, and it's a company-owned device. So I think the flexibility of the infrastructure is important in this idea economy, because it is so, cha it changes a lot. The, the scenarios, every company has multiple scenarios. So you're in a highly regulated business, you know, financial services, insurance, so you're kind of control freaks, you sort of have to be. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is that the Aruba technology allows you to yes. sort of dial up, dial down, yep. gives you that flexibility. Can you just add some color to that? 
Well, the other thing I, I want to point out, so the Surface 3 and laptops. So you, you have a laptop in front of you, and uh, you know when, you, when you're on a laptop, you're, you even have another experience. So now I all of a sudden want my Active Directory credentials, um, and I want my uh, authentication into applications. I want to have that desktop experience, but now I want to have it in a meeting room, and I may also be on a video or a link call or dialed into a bridge, all via my laptop. And so there's just, again, multiple scenarios. We call it the, you know, the right tool for the right job, but it's really about what is the employee most comfortable using, and then how can they be most productive anytime, anywhere, whether they're at home, whether they're in transit in an airport, or whether they're in our buildings or in a conference room. And and the, the, the big catalyst, of course, is mobile devices. I mean, it was interesting to hear Dom yesterday talk about when they started Aruba, the, the, they, it was Intel Centrino. Yeah. And I remember when Centrino came out, I was like, meh. You know, it didn't really excite me that much. Intel was pushing the ads out. It was like, okay, whatever. But then all of a sudden, you know, the wireless trend with, with smartphones comes out and a huge tailwind for organization, technology companies. Yeah. Yep. And a big, most IT practitioners I talked to sort of had a love-hate with it. It's like they love it because they get it and they're users, but on the other yep. hand, they got to deal with all this stuff. Now you have a story about you, you, you enabled, what, a thousand users with iPads? Yeah, was so it, we, yeah we, uh, we, we decided to provide every, you know, buddy with director and above with an iPad as a productivity device. And uh, unfortunately, we did not do full wireless surveys in advance. And we discovered the hard way that a lot of our corner offices uh, and in some of our important meeting rooms did not have adequate coverage. And so we had to sort of do an emergency wireless uh, assessment. I had to bring in a specialist and walk all the buildings, go into every office, actually sit down in chairs, go into every conference room, even with multiple people. And some of our conference rooms hold upwards of 200 people. And we would have people all of a sudden bringing in 100 iPads. <laughs> they did a banker's convention and they literally, all of them wanted Wi-Fi access, you know. And so, uh, <laughs> so we learned, uh, you know, the hard way that we had to build out the network infrastructure with the capacity and, and the security so that people could have that, that seamless experience. And so, can you describe sort of your 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 network? Is it's a campus sort of setup, or yeah? So um, the, the one of benefit that Pacific Life has is we own most of our main buildings. So we we aren't afraid to invest a little bit in the infrastructure of that building um, because we know that we're going to be there for a while, and that does change the game a little bit because uh, we have distributed antenna systems for wireless, mm -hmm. and then we have you know extensive Wi-Fi investments in those buildings to make sure that, that people have the right experience, not only in the building they normally work in, but we have buildings that are across the street in a campus. And we want to have the exact same experience when, when somebody walks across the street that they have when they're sitting in their own building or in their own office. So you had mentioned approximately a year ago when we were, you were on it, you were a relatively new HP networking customer yep. at the time. Yep. But what was the catalyst to go to HP, HP? networking? Um, we had an aging uh, network infrastructure with, with uh, sort of a legacy, you know, provider that was it was literally seven, eight, nine years old in certain locations, and we just started to experience, you know, issues. We had a couple outages, and we just decided it was time to to upgrade, you know, the entire network infrastructure. And we did a formal RFP. I talked about it in a in a uh, presentation yesterday, in, in a panel that I was on. But we went out and really did a. Competitive RFP narrowed it down to two of the big vendors, and everybody knows who the biggest vendor is. But HP was the second finalist. And when we brought everything in the lab, and we did our full side-by-side -side integration tests, and we we got on the equipment, did failover testing, we realized that HP met all of our requirements. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, we saved a little bit of money. And we were an HP server customer. We're also an HP desktop customer. So for us, there was some there were some synergies between server infrastructure and uh, the network, and now we're even looking at some of the three power as well. So, so you guys uh, have begun to talk about this sort of, you know, the mobile generation, the wireless, you know, first approach. Yeah. Maybe describe that a little bit. Sure, I mean, I think we've been touching on it. So we started off with Centrino kind of experience mm -hmm. where you had your laptop, right? Um, and then we moved to this world where you have tablets and smartphones. And as generation, um, and I don't think it has to be an age generation. I would like to imagine myself as part of what we call Gen Mobile. It's more how you behave. We're cool. Right? Yeah, <laughs> we're here for that. Um, so we're really wanting to use the devices everywhere, be productive all the time. They're not devices that were designed, uh, or I should I'll put it this way, they're consumer devices. So the experience that we're used to having on a laptop that is a little bit more robust antenna and wireless capabilities, our networks, the, the aging networks were not designed to handle these 
these kind of low power devices. So when you start bringing them all into a big conference room, they don't have great reception. They're not that powerful, right? Yet we love them. Um, so the, the network has to kind of adapt to these new style of devices. So I think you know the experience that Pacific Life went through is what we've seen in a lot of customers is, help, I have this network that was designed for more stationary users in one place with a big laptop. Now they have all these devices running around. Um, how do we uh, adapt our network, adapt our apps, adapt our IT to really go after this generation that wants to use these devices this way? So we really feel like wireless has become front and center uh, because of user experience concerns. And, um, and, we're, and we're watching our customers and helping our customers really transform their networks for that. So this new, we call it Gen Mobile, um, and it's this generation that wants to work from anywhere all the time, switching back and forth between personal and professional life. Um, and Aruba just feels like it's here to stay. You know, our customers are dragging us in there. So Alex, give us a practitioner perspective on that. So, so that sounds great, I buy into it, who wouldn't? But you have this installed infrastructure right. that you have to, have to deal with. So how do you go from where you've been historically to this sort of gen mobile vision? So we, uh, you know, we do it with the same networking team, but we have mobile specialists now, and we have data center infrastructure specialists. Um, and and the two, the, you know, the two systems are different. There's different technologies, and they all sort of join on the back end, and they all have to work together on the back end. And uh, you know, so we have architecture groups, and we have business user groups. We do you know business case scenarios, and then we talk about the experience. The big thing for us is user experience. Mm -hmm and what type of user experience are we trying to deliver? And for me, it really says, I want a, an executive or a person to be able to be on a mobile call, drive into our underground garage, get out of their car, stay on their phone, join into the network as they walk in the building, fire up GoToMeeting, access their documents, do all of that while they're, you know, while they're on their mobile device. And the average user now has two or three devices. So we have 3,000 employees, we have about 10,000 devices that we, that we manage. So it's not one device, it's not two, it's often three. Uh, you know, devices that, that an individual employee will have. So I'm curious as to the sort of justification <laughs> model because so many things in IT we have to run through, yep. you know, do the ROI and yep. you know, the flagpole. Is this more like, remember the, when the LAN, the, the LANs first came out? Yeah. Just, we need a LAN, okay, yeah. great. Was it yeah. more like that or do yeah. you have to go through sort of a formal ROI? Um, you know, we, we realized when we ran the numbers, I think last year that we were spending more money on mobile devices than on laptops. So we, we crossed that barrier. Um, and, and, and we sort of manage it, I'll call it, in bulk, which is we know we're going to spend a certain amount of money every year uh, on about a three-year refresh cycle on laptops, maybe four years on desktops, it's usually about three years. Mobile devices tend to be on a two-year cycle for a couple of reasons. They're tied to contracts, and there's a two-year refresh. Yeah. Um, and they also just tend to wear out, and then everybody, of course, wants the newest, greatest thing. So we tell employees, you cannot upgrade for two years. After two years, talk to your manager, and you may have to wait till three years, depending on budgeting and how we're doing, but somewhere between two and three years, you will be eligible for a new device. But you and, know, and, and that's kind of our, you know, we're not draconian about it, but we also try not to have upgrades. Yeah, some months. structure in There's policy. There's got to be some, some guidelines. Uh, but I, I also want to make the point that I think, um, Dominic Orr made this point in his, his, his keynote, that to some extent, your old infrastructure is keeping you back from your new infrastructure, because there's still all these support investments and mm -hmm. software licensing investments, so even if you're not using that desk phone, you're paying for the license sure. and the IPvBX. Yep. Um, I personally don't even know the password to my old desk phone that we ripped out. So I think if you can free yourself from the, the legacy investments that aren't even really getting used, it does free up some money to then invest into the new infrastructure. So the ROI gets a little bit easier when you look at it that way. Well, and the, the landline's a good example, right? That's right. easy. I, I think I even have on my phone message, don't leave a message yeah. here because I don't <laughs> check it ever. <laughs> and people still leave a message there. <laughs> but, uh, all right, Alex, I'll give you the last word. Again, we love the practitioner perspective. So you've gone through this transformation. Obviously, you know you, you got the had the surprise with the thousand <laughs> iPads, but yep. other than that, what other advice would you give to your peers around you know people looking to sort of move into that yep. mobile generation, wireless first? Yep. So a couple things: don't don't ignore the compliance, legal, HR front. So you do need to pay attention to security. We hire external pen test vendors, and we do wireless surveys. And uh, the one thing we didn't talk about. Aruba has a very nice, two, two nice products. Airway, which allows you to see the user, the user experience by user, and where they are in the building, and what access point they're atta attached to. 
They also have some really nice detection software that detects rogue access points. So if somebody brings in a Linksys home router or sets up a, a, an unauthorized access point, it can detect it right away and notify you. So you want to really pay attention, depending on what type of business you're in, to those aspects of wireless. Then the second part is, again, the user experience. What are you trying to accomplish from a user experience? And then once you decided that, then you have to assemble a team, a cross-functional team, and say, how are we going to build it, how are we going to support it, and how are we going to manage it? And that's, you know, it's really, it's just like any other big project, but wireless has its own unique challenges and its own unique flavors, but it's here to stay. You know, my kids now, we, we travel everywhere, even in Europe, and they, first question when they, we check into a hotel, what's the Wi-Fi password? <laughs> and they just, they just expect it, you know, and so we're, we're in that, we're in that world, and it's, I don't think it's going away. Excellent. All right, well, the industry's transforming, HP's transforming, the heart of that transformation, HP's networking group with the acquisition of Aruba. Alex and Sylvia, thanks very much for coming thanks to theCUBE. So it's really a pleasure having great. you. Thank you, David. All right, keep it right there. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>